Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning in First English. A couple of special prayers. First of all, you may have heard this already, but Shepherd tested negative for coronavirus, as did all the boys at the at the Campaneros, the cook that were cooking there. And Wardy was deemed not to need the test because he was never in close proximity to the, the cook that was the, the person that tested positive. So very thankful for that, that uh, there was no issues with that. And I got to move back into the house on Friday. Um, also, it's Wardy's 16th birthday today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Hard to believe, huh? Also, one special prayer. Um, Janet Miller called me this morning. She won't be here because she's having cataract surgery tomorrow, and she felt that it was the proper thing not to, to be in church the day before she had the surgery. So I thought some prayers with, with Janet and know that the Lord will see her through that procedure tomorrow. With that, we take all our prayers to our Lord, knowing he hears them and answers them according to his good and gracious will. And we begin by singing a wonderful hymn, hymn 875, Father, we praise thee. before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, worthy of us our sins, and lead us Amen. Dear friends, Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake He forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now join together in reading our intro with for this ninth Sunday after Pentecost, found in your service bulletin insert. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, 
call upon his name. And he known his deeds among the peoples. He spread a cloud for a covering. And the fire to be light by night. They asked and he brought quail. And gave him bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed to the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise. And he remembered his service. So he brought his people out with joy. His chosen ones of seen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Come, buy, and eat. 
Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which is not satisfied? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall not, behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that you do not know shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. Dear Christians, be not unaware, both Jews and Gentiles have a share in Jesus' saving work and vow, from Moses' exodus till now. For even then the pilgrim Jew Received the self-same Christ as you In cloud and sea baptized and led They ate the living heavenly bread Be careful, brethren, what you think The rock that gave refreshing drink and followed Moses' smiting rod was also Christ the Lamb of God. Despite man's evil, envious eye, for all men's good he dared to die. Each whom he calls receives as one the wages to God's holy Son. Beloved, run your race with eyes fixed on this everlasting prize. Let none who share this hope through pride at last be lost disqualified. Learn what God's law demands of you. Yet no Christ's promises are true, and clinging to his word of grace, you too will see his beaming face. Our epistle for this morning is from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. I am speaking the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the living, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call. She was told, the older will serve the younger, 
as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> chapter. Now when Jesus heard about the death of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the town. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came and said to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy themselves, buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the gospel of our Lord. We all joined together in confessing our faith. In the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life 
Dear friends, grace, peace, and mercy be yours this morning and always from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the account of the feeding of the 5,000. By the way, the only parable that's contained, and not parable, excuse me, the only miracle that's contained in every one of the Gospels for us. So I read for you from verses 18 through 21. Jesus said, bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000, besides women and children. This weekend I was thinking about <clears throat> the passage and the readings and thinking about what I was going to preach on. Really, in the Old Testament and the Gospel for sure, the Lord's Prayer kept coming through my mind. I think that's sort of a normal response when we hear the feeding of the 5,000. We hear about the reminder to God's people of the miraculous feedings in the desert. The Lord's Prayer is the perfect prayer. Carrie and I were talking about this recently. We were talking about just in general uh, people praying and, and how she recommends to people, and I do too, that when you're worried about something and things are on your mind, don't think you have to come up with a special prayer. Don't think you have to come up with some special words that hit just perfectly the subject that you're struggling with or worried about. Pray the Lord's Prayer. There's a reason Jesus said when you pray, pray this way. Because the Lord's Prayer covers everything. Everything in our lives perfectly. And our Father hears that petition because He taught us to pray that way in the name of Jesus. And over the years, I've shared stories with, with you at different times of people who make fun of us as Lutherans in a way. They make fun of us for praying the Lord's Prayer so often. Oh, you Lutherans, every time you get together, Lord's Prayer, before meetings, after meetings, before dinner, after dinner, before you get up in the morning, after you get up in the morning, Lord's Prayer, Lord's Prayer, Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer. And I had a really dear friend, I know I shared this, a very good friend, a, a woman I used to visit in a nursing home in Fort Wayne, who gave me the business all the time. Can't you Lutherans ever think of anything better to pray? Can't you think of your own words? And my response back there was always with a smile and, a, you know, and laughter. I'd say, Carolyn, how can I find any better words to pray than the, the words the Lord told me to use to pray? And in our readings for this morning, for sure in the Old Testament and in the Gospel, but really in all of them, we get a reminder of how perfect the Lord's Prayer is, especially when we focus specifically on the fourth petition. Because every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, in the fourth petition we ask our Lord, say it with me, what is the fourth petition? Give us this day our daily bread. Right? We're praying for the Lord to give us our daily bread. Now, we're taught as catechumens and in Sunday school, Always to think about the fact that when we're praying this, the Lord is promising to give us everything we need for the support and need of our body. Everything. In fact, we heard from the Catechism this morning that wonderful list of everything. Everything bodily, physically in this world. When we ask the Lord, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. We are in essence putting the Amen ahead of the petition and saying, we know, Lord, because you teach us this, that you promised through this to give us everything, because of Jesus, to give us everything we need in this life. Now, we could have a whole sermon on the fact that needs and wants are two different things, right? The Lord doesn't promise to give us everything we want, and we get those things confused, but through faith we know he promises to give us everything we need. Therefore, isn't this a wonderful thought? A little off track for a second, but isn't this a wonderful thought? Everything you have, think of it this way, everything you have is everything you need. Isn't that awesome? 
There's a different perspective on that. But in this prayer, again, we know that the Lord will fulfill everything we need in this life. But it's more than that. As one of my professors at the seminary used to teach us, we're not just asking for physical bodily needs in this petition when we say give us this day our daily bread. Dr. David Scare at the seminary used to remind us we're also asking the Lord and being reminded of the fact that he will give us our eternal daily bread as well in Jesus. So talk about having all your bases covered. Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord promises to give us everything we need here and in eternity. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? And that gets us really to our text. The feeding of the 5,000. When we read about this, hear about this, and, and learn about this, we ask ourselves a couple questions. I think they're always appropriate when we're studying the Bible. What happened? What's going on? And what is Jesus teaching us through what's going on? Right? So the first thing, we, we address the issue of what happened. Jesus had heard about the death of his cousin, John. Jesus is both fully, completely human, though without sin, and fully, completely divine, fully, completely God. His human nature and his divine nature wept over the fact of his cousin's death. John was beheaded by Herod for standing on the word of God. So Jesus withdrew to a lonely place out near the Sea of Galilee by himself to pray as he prayed regularly to his Heavenly Father. But because of who he was and because of what he had shown already about himself, people followed him. They gathered around him. And because he had compassion in that word, that word compassion, splachna is the New Testament Greek word that tells us the Lord had compassion. What that really means a little bit gross, but what it really means is the Lord had guts for the people. It means his whole insides were, were compelled. Everything about him was compelled to be compassionate for the sake of the people. So despite the fact that he wanted to go off by himself and spend a little time praying to his heavenly father about his sadness about what happened to John, he couldn't just do what he wanted to do because he is our Lord and Savior and he had compassion on the people that came to him. So he sat them down and he taught them. Now this is a huge gathering of people. We're told in the scripture there were 5,000 men, not a, not a, not a, what's the word, not a chauvinist thing like we think of it today that they only listed men. They just did it for categories, you know. It wasn't chauvinist in the modern sense of thinking about that word. But they, they listed the men, but we're told specifically that there were also the women and children there. So scholars over the years have rightly said that there were probably at least 15,000 people gathered here at this site when Jesus sat them down, had compassion on the fact they had followed this all this way to find him, and he sat down and he talked to them about the kingdom of heaven. And after that was over, it's getting near evening, and the disciples remind him, Lord, it's, we're out sort of in the middle of nowhere. I mean, this is a desolate place. It's a long ways to, to get back to town, and it's almost evening. Why don't you let them go now so they can get into town and get some food, buy something to eat, find something to eat? And Jesus looks at his disciples, and he said, they don't have to go anywhere. You feed them. What do you mean? What, what do you mean, Lord? How, how in the world? How could, how could we possibly feed them? We don't have anything. There's 15,000 people here. How in the world? All we have, all we have is this little boy's lunch basket, basically, that had five loaves in it and two small fish. And Jesus says, don't worry. Have everybody sit down. Have everybody sit down. Now, this is where it's important to remember. Those who don't believe in God and his word, though they claim to, though they might even say they do, though they might even go to church sometimes, those who don't trust in his word will come up with all sorts of excuses to say that this didn't really happen. This wouldn't really, Jesus didn't multiply the fish and the, and the loaves. This is just, a, this is just a, a parable to teach you about hospitality and teach you about going without and sharing what you have with other people. That's a bunch of hooey. 
That's just not true. I slipped up earlier because we've been in the parables. This is not a parable. This is historical fact. This is a historical event. Jesus sat down with these people in the desolate area on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he literally took five little loaves of bread and two little fish, said a prayer to God that this would be multiplied and he would feed the people. And 15,000 people ate till they were brimming to the full, completely, till their stomachs were full. And then he had the disciples pick up enough food left over that filled up 12 baskets. This is unbelievable. This is, this is historical fact. This event actually happened just as the Lord tells us in his word it happened. This isn't a parable or a metaphor or symbolic. or This has literally happened. So that moves us on to the next question then. What's the Lord teaching us here then? What do we learn from the fact that he sat 15,000 people down in a desolate, remote hillside out in the wilderness and produced food miraculously? to feed them from what seemed to human eyes to be not nearly enough, inadequate, totally. What do we learn from this? Well, first of all, I think we're reminded of those other miraculous feedings, right? We're reminded of a couple of other events, more than this, but let's focus on a couple. First of all, we're reminded of the Lord when his people grumbled in the desert, when they had escaped from Egypt and were wandering through the desert after the Red Sea had been parted and the Lord had saved them from Pharaoh's army, they started to do what we always do. The Lord knows I do all the time. They started to let their circumstances get them down and they started to grumble about it. We should have stayed in Egypt. We have better, at least we had food to eat there, better off than we are here. We should, What's all this going on? Why, why is this happening? And there the Lord, despite their grumbling, produced miraculously manna, bread from heaven, told them how to pick it every day, remember? Not go out and pick more than they needed for one day. On the Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath, they could pick two days' worth, so they didn't work on the Sabbath. But always providing while encouraging, trusting in his word, God provided them miraculously with bread from heaven in the middle of this desert wasteland. He also gave them quail. He also, when they were thirsty, gave them water out of a rock. Right? So certainly, this is reminding us, this, this event is reminding us of what took place with Moses and God's people of old in the desert. We're also reminded of another wonderful event. Again, historical fact. Remember in 1 Kings 17, when the Lord sends Elijah to the house of the widow from Zarephath. It's in the middle of a drought. Famine. She hardly had enough to feed herself, and she didn't have enough to feed herself and her son, her, her only son. And Elijah walks into the house boldly and says, Make me some bread. Oh, she said, I can't make any bread. I, I have a tiny, tiny little bit of flour and a tiny, tiny little bit of oil. It'll run out. We're going to die. I don't have enough. And Elijah, another great prophet of the Lord, tells her, don't worry about it. You make me a cake of bread with that flour and that oil. And the Lord will see to it that your flour never runs out and your oil never runs out. And she did. And guess what? Her flour jar remained full. Her oil jar remained full. She and her son and Elijah had plenty to eat. One more I think we should talk about a little bit. In John chapter 6, when Jesus is teaching the people again out in the wilderness a little bit, they come to him after he had, this is actually after the feeding of the 5,000 by the way, they followed him. They wanted to make him their bread king. They wanted him to be like a magician that would keep them in, in full in, in food and all they needed earth, earth wise, earthly wise. And Jesus said, don't 
Chase after that kind of stuff. You don't need to chase after it. The Lord will provide with it. Chase after bread from heaven. Chase after things that will last, that the moth will not eat and rust will not destroy. And so they ask Jesus a question. They say, what must I do to have this, Lord? And he says, the work of God is this. Believe in the one he has sent. And they logically ask him the question, well, how, how do we know? What have you done? What have you done that we can believe in you? And he said, your forefathers ate manna in the desert, right? God sent them to, sent that manna, but they still died eventually. Well, now God has sent me, and I am the living bread from heaven. He who ever feeds on me will not die, ever. And he calls himself literally the bread of life. Boy, if that doesn't sort of tie this all together. What do we learn from the feeding of the 5,000 men? Well, it's not exactly in Scripture, but Jews, from the Exodus on, in their Talmud, in their historical documents, in their, in their commentaries, if you will, that their Pharisees and the scribes and the rabbis put together, they taught the sign of the Messiah returning. Among other things, or many of them, but one of the most prominent signs that the Messiah, the long-awaited, long-promised Messiah had finally come, would be once again God providing through him, you got it, bread from heaven, manna in the desert, fulfilling all those promises. And here, what's amazing is Jesus always does this. The people thought Moses was the greatest man who ever lived. Abraham, of course, is right up there. Elijah was right up there because he was a great prophet. Here, Jesus, by producing the bread from heaven himself, and by calling himself the very bread of life that comes down for the life of the world, he has proven he is far greater than just these men, Moses, Elijah, all of them, that he, in fact, is God the long-awaited Messiah, the true bread from heaven that we consume, that feeds us in all ways and promises us that we will never die and have eternal life in his name. It's amazing what we get from Scripture and how the Lord teaches us and ties everything about his history together. So in the end, for today, as we're sitting here in Dorset in 2020, all wearing masks on our faces, wondering what's going to come of everything, what's happening to the world, what's going on in our lives. What do we take away from this wonderful account of the feeding of the 5,000? Well, I think you come away with one thing, and I hope you do, that the Lord's Prayer covers everything. The Lord's Prayer. You don't need anything else than the Lord's Prayer. Fine, pray whatever you want. Pray whatever your faith leads you to pray, but the Lord's Prayer, dear friends, in good times and in bad times, in times of fullness and in times of want, the Lord's Prayer is our perfect prayer given by our Lord and covers everything. And in the fourth petition, we can trust when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. That the Lord, because he always has kept his promises, because he's always done everything he said he would do for his people, that we can rest assured and be in peace every day that everything we need for body and soul, for life in this world, for life eternally will be taken care of. And I think the most important thing we learn in this feeding of the 5,000 is that reminds us Jesus truly is the Lord and Savior of the world. Everything that all of the scriptures pointed to from the very beginning, the living bread from heaven, the bread of life that we feast on in his word, in his body and blood and holy communion and baptism, and remember that every day when we wake up, remember who we are. We feast on him. And because he is the living bread, the bread of life, 
That means we never, ever will die when we have everything we need and we are forgiven all our sins in Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever into Christ Jesus, the bread of life, unto life everlasting. Amen. your needy children on earth. <clears throat> and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend those we mentioned in prayer at the start of service this morning and those we now name before you in our hearts. And all who are in need, praying for them at all times, thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy, grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us to trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, and lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now hear us when we pray in his name and as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. here in our Nevis troop. And that's going to be held out at Kramer Farm by Akeley. And I will be gone a lot of the week, but not all week like I have been in the past. I'll be here for the things that we have on the schedule, uh, Bible studies and book reading and things like that. But I will be gone a lot of the week because of the, the scout camp. But I have my phone with me, so if anybody needs to reach me, you can always get a hold of me. Um, we have council meeting this Tuesday, 7 o'clock. And I mentioned that the book readings, the Bible studies, those things will continue on uh, this week. Holy Communion for our August calendar will be a week after this week, following week for two weeks. So please sign up for that. Um, everybody out there, check with Jeannie and she'll sign you up for those dates that work best for your schedule. Okay? And I guess that's all I need to say.